or other dementia. Memory loss that's disrupting your life. Losing your keys. I lose my keys. I don't have dementia. Well. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's that I, if I have difficulty retracing my steps back to where I might have put the keys, that's a sign. Problems with concentration and problem solving, things that wouldn't otherwise disrupt your daily life now are becoming a problem. Problems with concentration, any mood or personality changes. The one thing I want to really stress to you is that these things happen over time. They don't just appear one day and all of a sudden you have Alzheimer's. These things really develop gradually and the one thing to very much keep in mind is that these things can also be signs of other issues in your life. Vitamin deficiency, an infection of some kind, and a reaction to a medication, depression that's going un untreated. These are the things that you want to bring up to your doctor. That's a difficult thing to do, but that is the next step to take when you see those symptoms and they start to disrupt your life. Shall I go on? Either of you. Um, first step, primary care physician. Bringing those symptoms to that person and saying, I, you know, these have got me concerned. What can I do? You know, they're going to run a battery of tests. It might be a mini mental status exam, which is a series of questions. You may have taken that before. But to determine really what's going on, is there a memory issue? But they're also going to run all these tests to sort of rule out depression, rule out an infection, things that might be reversible and treatable. If the doctor is concerned, the next step would be to see a neurologist, neurologists who specialize in brain disorders who can then run a series of tests to really kind of come to a conclusion, is this really Alzheimer's that we're dealing with? The next step is, if I get the diagnosis, what do I do? The first reaction is to isolate and withdraw. You might want to consider GCM, geriatric care manager. That is one person you could hire, come in, take an overview of what's going on, and help you come up with a plan of care for that individual. And by the way, Tammy, I just wanted to mention, because we're going to talk about GCMs just a second in terms of the plan, but oftentimes people will talk to me about this and they'll say they really don't want to talk to their doctor because they don't want to know. I mean, they don't want the doctor to put it in the chart, right, that they've got this early stage because they're afraid this is going to trigger some other stuff, right? In that case, if you, you know, if you want to know but you don't want the doctor to know, I know that sounds terrible, right? But if that's the case, GCMs, geriatric care managers are great people to talk to because that's, one of, that's basically what they do. You've got specialists who are, tip, are typically uh, nurses or social work, and or social workers who have decided that they really like dealing with elders. They want this is their specialty to be trying to help elders figure out how, what, what their issues are and what their care plan could be. So that GCM could talk to you about that, could talk to the person that may be having some early stage things and at least get a sense as to whether it may be really sensible to talk to a doctor further about that. Um, the importance of socialization. I can't emphasize that more. Um, socialization with any diagnosis of any type of dementia is key in slowing down that progression. You don't use it, you lose it. And that is true of your brain, your body, everything. So keep engaged. Um, do you want to speak to and the And briefly, I just want to talk about, it, at this point, if you haven't dealt with restructuring your assets and you find out that you may have some issues, 
but you do have some pile of assets that you're trying to deal with. It is now, and, it, and you're single, because remember, in the case of Frank and Mary, it, in those situations, things could always be shifted to the spouse that doesn't have Alzheimer's. But if you're just Mary and Mary Jr., and you're both very concerned because Mary now appears to be getting early stage Alzheimer's, one thing that you could do, it's not as good as having just gifted the money to Mary Jr. five years ago, but one thing you can do is you can enter into a care agreement with Mary Jr., between Mary and Mary Jr., right? You'd want to base that care agreement probably on an analysis by the geriatric care manager to make, who is making recommendations regarding how much care you need. That agreement, as long as it is in writing, done in advance, specifies how much the, Mary Jr. is being paid per hour to provide this care, and as long as Mary Jr. then documents the hours that she works, Mary can pay Mary Jr. to provide that care. Now, Mary Jr. is now not receiving a gift, she's receiving income, and therefore it's going to be taxable. So she's going to be losing a percentage of that money in taxes, right? But at least she's saving a good deal of the money if they know that the alternative is they're worried about, you know, at the end of the day or in a few years, there's going to be nursing home care down, down the road. Now, can you just talk about, there's, there is a, there, there are, Tammy, Tammy does the one kind of full day program around here which is not based on, not for people whose, whose Alzheimer's is so severe that they really need kind of ongoing nursing care. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Sure, because you should be very much educated on the different forms of adult day and what that means. There's adult day health, that's a medical model. Folks that need hands-on care, um, activity of daily living care. Drug administration. Drug administration that type of thing. Then there's the social model. For folks who are still independent, can still provide their own activities of daily care, utilize the bathroom, eat independently, but what has happened to these individuals is because of the Alzheimer's diagnosis or dementia, they withdraw, they isolate. They, it's very difficult for someone with dementia to actually come down to a senior center and self-initiate these activities for themselves pick and choose what they want to do, create friendships. What Pleasantries does is offer that environment to them so that they are engaging with 10 to 14 other folks who have all similar issues. And it provides positive, failure-free, successful activities. They get meals, we go on day trips. The one key that I've found in the last five years is that I've had reports back from families, less depressed, sleeping better at night, putting on weight, less of, of you know, other dementia symptoms. So it's definitely positive. And to the caregivers, they get a break. They can now take care of what their own needs and wishes are. If it's a spousal situation, maybe the spouse go, with the disease process goes to an adult day program while the other spouse comes down to the senior center and joins in or goes for a golf or does something for themselves. So that's the point to this program. By, by the way, speaking of that, and before we do that kind of later stage for elder waiver, could you also mention what's going on in Hudson? This is an interesting program. In the course of doing the presentation, I found out they've just started. Uh, what it's called the Daybreak. Program, which may be something that, that we may be really wanting to look at. And I see some folks from the Council on Aging here. But we may be wanting to look at here in terms of trying to develop a similar kind of program. It's a, an incredible thing that Janice Long at the Hudson Senior Center has worked on um, tirelessly. It's a, a grant funded program through Bay Path. And myself at Pleasant Trees, Aging Well Adult Day Health in Marlboro, Marlboro Hills Healthcare, and Comfort Keepers Home Care. We've partnered with Hudson Senior Center to provide the staffing programming in our hours um, to give care. It's a setup like Pleasantries. It runs like Pleasantries, social model. It's run every Thursday for three hours for $15. You can't get that type of care somewhere else for that money. But what it does is it introduces the caregiver to possibly that separation, introduces the person with the memory problem to another environment and relieves the caregiver only for three hours to give them what they need to do. And, and thank you, Tammy. And the reason why I mention that is it would be probably impossible to run that program here because you just don't have the space. Don't have the space. 
But I have heard that a senior center may be in the offing, right? From zero to 100. I mean, yeah. a few years ago, we wouldn't have guessed this, but it seems like things are pretty much full blast. So this may be really something that could get offered here if the goal, once again, is to provide first some time for folks who've got maybe early stages of dementia to be with other folks who've got early stages of dementia, which is actually a place where they can feel comfortable, you know, because, you know, nobody remembers the joke. You know, it gets repeated a lot. And they're, they're, so it helps both the folks who have got early stage and also the folks who are at home. So it's maybe something that we in Marlboro really want to look at. I want to be taking any questions at the end, but hold that, hold that question, Melissa, all right? But can, now, so now I want to talk about, and I'd like um, um, Susan to talk about the Frail Elder Waiver and the other programs that are offered by BayPath. As I have often said here, um, so I'm not just saying it because she's here, you really want to know the people at BayPath Elder Services. This is not a for-profit entity. This is a nonprofit that contracts with the state to basically be providing services to elders, right? They are also the eyes and ears in many ways of mass health. BayPath are the folks who certify if you've got late-stage Alzheimer's, whether you're eligible for nursing home care. They also certify whether you're eligible for something called the Frail Elder Waiver, and, and, and we're going to be talking about that. And if you are eligible for that program and therefore can stay home, they decide how much care you can get if you're at home. So we asked um, Susan to come over to talk about the, about the programs, right? And, and we're going to talk quite a bit about the Frail Elder Waiver. I just wanted you to see this statistic. There are in all of the Bay Path communities, and there are a lot of them from here, east through Framingham to Wayland, up to Hudson, down to Holliston, there are 138 people now on the Frail Elder Waiver Program. By contrast, I don't know if you know this number, but how many people from those communities are now in nursing homes? You know, I don't know that number. Because the figure that I had heard was something like 30,000. Yeah, it's right? a lot. So there's a lot of room to grow the Frail Elder Waiver Program, and the state wants to grow this program. They want people to be staying at home. 